good evening. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your, no doubt, very busy schedule to join us here at the AFNA webinar. The title of the webinar, The Power of Influence, which is all about leadership for nurses in primary care. Now, I'm absolutely thrilled to have so many people having taken the time out to join us tonight. There's, we can see a list, there's quite a number of people here. And what excites me the most is that so many people uh, have an interest in this whole idea of leadership. Why that's of interest for me is because that's what I spend my time doing. I spend my time working with organisations and individuals on this whole question of leadership within, within the work that they do. Now, just by way of introduction, my name's Stuart Constable. I'm going to give you a few more details about me in just a moment. But what I wanted to let you know, just from an administrative point of view, that we've got some polls that are going to be running throughout the webinar tonight. Now, that adds to the interactivity of the experience, but it also serves another purpose, which is for us to collect some data, some data for me to understand your perspectives on certain issues related to leadership. But also, at the same time, it allows AFNA to gather some data about who's actually joined us this evening for the webinar. So what we really encourage is when you get the, the prompt or the cue for a webinar, for a poll to appear, what I'd like you to do is actually respond to that poll so that we actually capture the data that we're looking for. So they will be running intermittently throughout the evening. So when you see it, please participate. Now, what I would like to, uh, to do is just give you a bit of a, an outline as to where we're going in, in, this particular, uh, in this particular webinar tonight. And our agenda. So the, the agenda is really broken up into five core parts. Firstly, we'll do some introductions about, uh, about myself and also invite you to introduce yourself, not verbally, but uh, by, by virtue of poll. We're going to also then uh, move into the cut and thrust of our presentation tonight, and that's going to be in three parts. We're going to investigate the qualities of leaders. What is it that makes a leader tick? What is it that allows a leader to be distinguished from the other people within, with whom they work? We're going to be looking at also what the actions of leaders are. Now this is critical because leaders are measured on their outcomes, what they're able to achieve. It's not, uh, they're not measured on their ideas, they're not necessarily measured on their intent, but what they are measured on is what they achieve, and things are only achieved through action. So we're going to spend some time looking at tonight, looking at the whole idea of the actions of leaders. Now toward the end of the, uh, the session, we're spending some time looking at how leaders influence others. Now, we all have influence, there's no doubt about that. But what sort of influence are we having is the question. Is it more of a positive or perhaps a negative influence that we're having on the people around us as leaders? And we're going to look at some models around that and what we can do in order to extend our influence because that's ultimately what we're here tonight to uh, gather and identify. Now, as with all webinars, what's really important is throughout the, throughout the session you may start to have some questions come to mind. What we really like you to do is to uh, record those questions or to share those questions uh, w when it comes time toward the end of the evening, in about 60 minutes time thereabouts. We're going to dedicate uh, about 10 or 15 minutes to any questions so that uh, anything that has come to mind around the question of leadership, I'm more than happy to uh, take those questions on and do my utmost to answer them to your satisfaction. So that's more or less where we're at. So let's, let's move into the key part of the, uh, of the session uh, tonight so that we've got an opportunity to investigate this whole area uh, of intrigue that's associated with leadership. So firstly, uh, an introduction. Now, just seeing some of the names of people who uh, are participating in the, in the webinar tonight, I've seen some names that I'm familiar with, but there's many there that I'm not. So just by way of introduction, my name's Stuart Constable and uh, I'm the founder of the Centre for Inspired Leadership. And over the last well, 25 plus years, I've worked with organisations uh, as a trainer and a facilitator, as a speaker, an author and a mentor. And my work uh, over the years has taken me across Australia, definitely, but I've also had the benefit and the privilege of working in other countries such as New Zealand and as well as Singapore and Manila in the Philippines. Spent some time in Hong Kong working with different clients over there, as well as Kuala Lumpur, and I spend uh, some time every quarter of the calendar year over in Abu Dhabi working with the UAE government. Again, all, on issue, uh, all my time being spent on issues of leadership. And what this has taught me is that whether I'm speaking here uh, from the AFNA office in South Melbourne, or I'm in Auckland, or I'm in Abu Dhabi, the same issues and the same questions keep coming up 
around around leadership and how do we lead effectively and what does it take for us to, to lead effectively. So what I like to do is help leaders extend their influence, increase their influence by primarily focusing on the people, productivity and performance of, uh, of the organisation. So that's what I'm looking forward to sharing with you this evening. So uh, just to give you an idea of, of uh, some of the work that we have done, that uh, some of the clients I've been working with over the last 12, 18 months, two years uh, most recently, uh, we've worked in a whole range of different sectors, uh, be it government, local, state and federal government, as well as uh, educational institutions and corporates, whether they are um, uh, private or publicly listed organisations. So what's coming up right now are some polls again, which we're asking you to respond to, just again to gather some statistics of the people who have uh, taken the time out to join us here this evening. So if you could respond to those as we're going, that would be absolutely um, ideal. Now we're also going to ask you to identify where in fact you're, you're from, because there's another polling question that's going to arise very shortly about where, what part of Australia you're actually representing tonight. It would be great for me, personally, just to get an idea of where people are from. And so when that polling question comes up, please, if you could respond to that as well, that would be fantastic. All right, well, let's get into the, 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 the cut and thrust of the, of the evening, which is all around, firstly, the, the qualities of leaders. Now, perhaps some of you have had the benefit or the privilege to, to work with someone you would identify as a great leader. Now, it's interesting because some people define, we define it all in, uh, in different ways of what makes a great leader. And we're going to spend again some time investigating that in, uh, in a little while. But what I'd like to do is put a question to you. And that question is a question that I like to uh, share and ask of people in workshops as well as in webinars and, and to ask for your response. Now, this isn't a polling question, this one coming up. It's actually just an open question. And you'll notice there at the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, if you look to that direction now, you'll see a chat box or a, a space there for you for a dialogue to be had. Now, what I'd like you to do is uh, when you have this, received this question, I'd like you to respond by putting your answers into that box because I'd like to see what your responses are. And we'll build on those as we progress. So my question to you is this. Why would anyone want to be led by you? So why would anyone want to be led from, by you? So I'd like you to uh, just jot an idea down. It could be just a word or it could be something um, more significant than that, even more lengthy. But I'd like to see that uh, some of the, where, what people are saying about why they would be led by you. Another way of thinking of it is if there was an election tomorrow in your workplace of who is to be our leader, why would people vote for you? What are some of the, what would drive people to do that? So I'm friendly and open-minded, I'm trustworthy. Uh, due to my experience, I listen and I am sincere. They feel they could grow professionally and personally. Uh, they're fair, sense, uh, they're coming through thick and fast. Um, to learn, I'm prepared to listen. Wow, I'm approachable. I can't read this fast, but, um, but it's great. I'm fair, approachable and enthusiastic. Fantastic, Claire said no one else putting their hand up to it, so I'm just gonna jump in anyway. Good on you, Claire. And I have a goal and I know how to get there. That's a, that's a fantastic driver for why people would want to follow you. I'm organised, I listen and I'm passionate. And that's, that's a really interesting thing about passion. And we're, we're going to not necessarily use that word, but in terms of that inspiration, we're going to be talking about that a little later. Um, uh, what else are people saying? I'm trustworthy and approachable. Uh, I consider all and I make decisions that will be optimum for us all. Ability to see both sides. Now, that's... That's a wealth of responses, certainly more than I'd expect uh, in a workshop of just, say, a dozen or 20 people that I'm used to. So, um, so that's great. Thank you so much. It's great to get a sense of what people uh, feel is what they bring to the game, what they bring to the role of, of, of leadership. Now, I think it would be fair to say that not everyone has all of those things that are listed. It, it, it rarely resides in one person. But the critical thing about effective leaders is that they're mindful of the need to evolve. And that's what leadership is about. It's an evolution. I really question the person who uh, suggests to, to us all that they're, they're a leader and they've got it all. Because leaders recognize the need to continue learning. 
And, uh, and John C. Maxwell, who's authored many, many books on leadership, always talks about the ongoing lifelong learning of leadership. And that's what it certainly is. It's around continually learning. So some of the, some of the other things that um, might be suggestive of the fact that we've got uh, uh, the need to, or further qualities, I should say, around leadership would, would certainly be around this question of courage. And as they're coming up here on the list, it, courage is a critical factor, I think, because leadership is not easy. Leadership is uh, not straightforward. It's complex. There's no doubt about that. And so leaders, who people who take on this role, such as yourselves, who are, who are leading, we need to recognise the, the challenge that exists within leadership and recognise the fact that I'm going to need to be quite courageous. I'm going to need to have the courage to stand up and have a voice. I'm going to need to have uh, the courage to question people and, and their behaviour. I'm going to need to have the courage to bother changing things. It's, it's critical as leaders that we recognise this courage. One of the other qualities of leaders is their, their desire to create change. The status quo is really at risk when it comes to leaders. The reason for that is because it goes hand in hand with that idea of continual evolution. Because what leaders recognise is that the, the way that what we have right now isn't necessarily the best it can possibly be. And the, the, right in their crosshairs is the idea of uh, taking out the sacred cows. Because there's a, there's a great title of a book that says, Sacred Cows Make the Best Burgers. And what they mean by that is that leaders need to have the courage to create change and perhaps kill off some of those sacred cows. That's not necessarily what we've got right now is the best way to, to get stuff done. Uh, leaders are decisive. They have, um, they're, they're prepared to make decisions and possibly make decisions that aren't all that popular, which ties in again about creating change and, and having the courage to do so. They have a, a strong awareness of what's going around them on around them, not just internally within the workplace, but also in the bigger environment. So they have, they're aware of what's happening in their marketplace. They're aware of what's happening in their industry. Uh, they're aware of what's happening potentially in internationally. They see trends. They see what's coming across the horizon. And that informs them and the decisions that they're going to make. I think one of the greatest things around lead, uh, those who uh, effectively lead others is that they have a strong sense of accountability. We often see people whose uh, results from their team aren't all that good and they're very quick to point the finger at, at whose fault or who is to blame. And that's not leadership at all. Leadership is recognising that people are accountable for their contribution. And ultimately, the team's outcome is the responsibility and part of the accountability of a leader. And so what we need to recognise is that accountability goes hand in hand with, with good, effective leadership. Optimism is a really powerful quality for leaders as well because they have a strong uh, drive around positivity. They don't, they don't moan and complain. They, they see that there is a direction to take and we need to keep working there despite the, the challenges of working in that environment. They, they, things don't always go according to plan, of course. There are, there are challenges. There are things, uh, results aren't necessarily met or timelines or budgets or people aren't necessarily always easy to work with. However, what leaders, uh, effective leaders do is that they have a strong sense of optimism around what the future holds. And they embrace that and they communicate that sense of optimism as well. A few other qualities that go hand in hand with what you've described um, as well is a strong sense of empathy, that is understanding other people and, and having a sense of what, what they're going through. But also from an, uh, being empathetic, it's around recognising that I don't need to get into the situation with the person because that doesn't help. What empathy is all about is reaching in and helping that person out of the situation. It's not getting into the situation. Recently, uh, during the warmer weather in Melbourne, which we don't currently have, um, I went uh, for some walking in the Grampian Ranges in, as part in uh, country Victoria. And we went for a walk and there was my wife and my three children and we went for a walk and the kids got themselves into uh, into one of the little crevices that, that we had to walk through and traverse through in order to get to our destination. And, uh, and what was really interesting is that the, the two younger ones had difficulty getting out of, the, um, out of this little situation they were in. And what I could have done was actually jumped into the hole with them and lifted them up. But that was going to make my job a whole lot more difficult and, and not necessarily the most, uh, the most effective um, approach to take. 
so what it, what we recognised was it's much much better for me to lean down and lift them up individually, as opposed to getting into the hole with them and trying to work a way out of it from there. So as a metaphor, don't always jump in the hole with the person who's stuck in the hole. That's what empathy is about. It's about standing outside the hole, reaching in and trying to lift them out. Other characteristics, just very quickly, strong, strong sense of focus, strong um, drive around honesty and integrity. And the other thing that I've highlighted in as a quality of effective leaders is the other quality of effective leaders is their strong sense of confidence. And that is their ability to keep striving forward, to keep moving forward so that, they, uh, so that they're always moving toward their ambition and what their goal happens to be. So the point being that leaders evolve. We don't have all of these characteristics or all these qualities. There's no doubt about that. No one person does. But it's about that understanding of an, there's an opportunity for us to continually evolve and um, become better and better at, at what we do. So from the qualities of leaders, what does it take for the action of leaders? And that's what I'd like to spend a little bit of time on right now. Because as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that it's important to recognize that your leadership is not measured or evaluated on your intent. It's not measured or evaluated or uh, assessed according to your ideas. The quality of leadership is assessed by your outcome and what you're able to accomplish with the people around you. And that takes action. And so the, the point being is what, what are the actions that are critical for a person to uh, act effectively as, as a leader? So the, the, big, the big question is why is there this big fuss and focus around the question of leadership. What, why is it such a big thing? And if you do a Google, uh, a Google search on leadership, or if you go to Amazon, better still, and, and do a search for books on leadership, you'll come up with millions and millions of results. And the reason being is because everyone's got an opinion. Everyone's got a view. And uh, it's, it's critical for the success of, of organizations, as we'll uh, investigate a little later. But I'd just like to get a sense uh, with a very quick polling question, uh, and that is, how many of you would be in a leadership role right now? So there's a quick poll just going to come up onto your screen. How many people are on, in a leadership role? And if you answer yes, that means you recognize your role as a leadership role. But if you answer no, it could be you um, have an interest in this whole question of leadership, which is why you joined us tonight. Or alternatively, you may be an aspiring leader, person wanting to make a move in that direction. So you'd answer no if those two descriptions perhaps suited you. But if you are in that management or senior position to um, where you're at. So just looking at, at our results, about 60-odd um, percent of people on this call tonight uh, in leadership positions, as I'm seeing the statistics come up. And about um, 30, 39, 38, 40 percent of people are not. And whether, whether you're in a leadership position or not, the question remains is, why is there such a focus on leadership? Because what's happened in the past is that there, there is this mixing of uh, thinking around leadership and management. And it's really a question that I have for you. And that is, what would be the differences between management and leadership? Are there differences between management and leadership? And I'd like you, if you can, to provide a, a tsunami of answers like you did with my first open question, and that was, to, um, to suggest to us what, what, what's characteristic of, of the role of a manager and what's more characteristic of a role of a leader. And if you've got a word or two, that's all it needs to be. It doesn't need to be anything lengthy. Um, and I'll just see some of your um, questions or some of your responses coming up. So um, a manager is an organizer. Uh, managers think about the changes leaders make the change. It's a great point. Uh, leaders can, can be in any role. Uh, leaders are visionary, great point. Management is a role, leadership is an ideology. That's a fascinating point. Um, and what else have we got? Managers, leader is on the factory floor. Leader is someone that can take people with you. Can be in management and not be a leader. That's a great point that you've added there. And leaders are influencers, but suggesting therefore that, uh, that managers may not be. Uh, managers have knowledge of the job at hand. I think that's what it is. Manager, uh, systems organizer, leaders inspire, 
manager tells people what to do, leaders show people what to do. Gee, you've done some reading and you've had some great experiences around leadership because what you're capturing here around management leadership is absolutely what, uh, what, what many commentators are, uh, are suggesting. And so what we've got is there are differences between managers and leaders. And what I'd like to do is just uh, share with you what some of those uh, other observations are, just a, a little more formally perhaps. And there may be some of you taking notes and things like that as we're progressing. Uh, and uh, th these might be of use to you. So what we t typically find is that managers deal with the status quo, and that is with the here and now and how things are currently, and try to make achieve the best results with what they've got. Now, that's absolutely critically important. But if we're, wear, if we're wearing the hat of the leader, what we've got is a person who encourages change. And it goes back to that point I made around the qualities of leaders a little earlier. And that is that leaders recognise the need for change. And uh, managers are, are comfortable with the status quo, but there may be uh, identified a need to actually change what's going on at the moment. What we also have are managers who have a short-term focus. And what do we mean by a short-term focus? It would be anything up to a year. Uh, would be in um, organisational um, terms, would be considered a short-term focus, anything up to 12 months. What leaders need is naturally a long-term focus. Because what can happen is that uh, organisations can be so focused on the here and now, uh, they don't see what's coming ahead. They don't have an eye on the horizon. And therefore, leaders need to have that long-term focus. And it's about, that's one of the characteristics of effective leadership, is that ability to have that long-term focus. They work in the system, do managers. They work in the system, whereas leaders are working on the system. And that is, again, around looking for opportunities to improve what we've got. So managers are able to do the very best they can and do a fantastic job, those great lit managers, they're able to do a fantastic job with the resources they've got, the authorising environment they've got, the, the systems they have, uh, and, and the resources they've got access to. Whereas leaders are always working on the system and, and seeing opportunities for, uh, for improvements in that system, which goes back to that earlier point about encouraging change. But this work on the system doesn't necessarily happen overnight because they have that long-term focus. There may be a sense that there's no need to change by others in an organisation setting or workplace or your general practice. However, longer term, there may be identified this need to make some change. Uh, managers react at, based on the situation and the, and the environment that they find, um, whereas leaders create opportunities to act. And that's, that's uh, quite different in terms of how we respond to our environment. And it can be reactive, which is absolutely we need to do, uh, based on the set of circumstances we have in front of us. But uh, leaders are always looking to create opportunities to act, to take action in, in a positive sense. Managers enforce rules. There's policies, there's procedures, there's practices that we need to follow in order to get the job done. And that is absolutely critical to, to the well-being of an organisation, as well as, in, in our case in general practice, the well-being of our patients. We need to follow rules. And what uh, leaders are looking to do is, is, should the need arise, to change rules. And there's an old adage that says uh, uh, that the managers are looking to, to do the right uh, to do the right thing, uh, doing things right, I should say, whereas leaders are looking to uh, to do do the right thing. I think I've got that right. I don't. Know. I hope you get that. But um, but some some other points being uh, that. Uh, that they uh, managers seek and follow direction, and that is that may be imparted by the uh, the environment or the proprietor or the board or whoever is in that position to provide that direction, whereas leaders are looking to actually provide a, a vision for the future and establish an alignment for that workplace to actually embark on that vision. So very different seeking and following direction as opposed to establishing a vision. For what we also have, some other character, oh, uh, differences, managers have um, uh, very much about controlling the situation. And that's very much part of the definition of management, is, is to control or contain. Uh, and that's very much what managers do, whereas leaders are there to inspire. And what we mean by that is to enable people to look beyond where they are right now and see what the potential, what the potential is. So we're looking at this difference between managers and leaders, and are there differences 
I think you would agree that there certainly is. And managers, uh, in conclusion, are instruct and direct, whereas leaders are very much about coaching and empowering other people, the people that are inside their organisation or possibly people outside. They coach and empower people to, to do their very best. And instruction and direction is absolutely necessary, but so is the ability to coach and empower them. So, so my, my, my question would be, as, uh, as another polling question, it, it, once it does appear, do, uh, do good managers necessarily make, um, make good leaders? And uh, whether you, do, do you agree with that? Do good managers always make good leaders? And uh, do good managers always make good leaders? I would say perhaps not always. It's um, because to be an effective manager, you're able to do everything that's listed on the left-hand column. Um, on that slide, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're able to do everything on, on the right-hand side of that ledger. And so whilst there are so many great managers who are great leaders, there are many who are great managers but don't necessarily make that extra, take that next step to be a successful or an effective um, uh, leader. So it's, it's a real challenge for us. So I just want to just summarise this discussion to some extent, and that is, what, what management and leadership is all about is management is about process in my view. I'd like to summarise it as, as describing it as process. And that is, man, management is focused on the process that's needing to happen right there, right then. Whereas leadership is about the people component. Now, another way of suggesting this is if you took away all the people from an organisation, from a workplace, from your general practice, from any setting you like, if you took away all the people, would there be a need for leadership? And my, quest, my, my thought would be probably not. But if you took away all the people, would there still be a need in that setting for management? And I'll say yes, because there's still many, many things that need to be managed. There's systems, there's processes, there's products, there's stock, there's inventory, there's timelines, there's resources. There's so many different things that still need to be managed. Those sorts of things aren't what we lead. What we lead are people. What we manage is process. Now, the, the challenge we have around that is that if you, if you look at yourself and you think, well, what's my natural bent? What, what, what am I inclined to want to do more of? And I would say there'll be some of you on this call tonight who would perhaps uh, be more inclined to be process oriented. And that's critical. And the reason being is that when you go to work of a day, you've got um, a list of things to do and what, where you get a great deal of satisfaction out of your day is seeing that list ticked off, for instance, and that the systems are in place and things have been done and timelines have been met and everything's in order. And we've met the needs of our patients and we've met budgets and we've done everything that we need to get done on that day. That can be a, a great sense of satisfaction for you at the end of the day. There are some of you on this call who are more inclined to be people oriented. And what I mean by that is that where you get a buzz of an afternoon is dependent on the sort of interactions you've had with the people at work. It might be around the conversations you've had, how much you've learnt about a person's situation, the, uh, the dialogue you've shared, the stories you've told and heard. Uh, and how you've been able to help or coach other people. It's been, a, your, your buzz comes from wanting to assist and looking for those opportunities to assist. And often a to-do list might, at times, just get in the way of a good day. So, um, so what you find is um, a, 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 a lot of satisfaction coming from the people side of the organisation, uh, of your experience. Now, the challenge for us, though, is that ideally, our workplace is a blend of both. What we need is the ability to bring those two disciplines together. When I, when I talk about this in workshops, it's really interesting, and I can't necessarily tonight, but I invite people to comment on this, this, uh, this dichotomy around management and leadership. And 
And what's really interesting is that it's almost like management is described as wearing a black hat and leadership is the one that wears the white hat. Leaders are the ones who ride in on the, uh, as, a, as the knight on a white, on a white steed and, and, and rescue the organisation from, um, from its problems. And it's not like that at all. Uh, management is not better than leadership. Leadership is not better than management because those organisations, and there's plenty of examples of them out there, those organisations that thrive are the organisations that recognise the need for both and develop both within that workplace. So our talk, our, our, um, our discussion tonight is, is around leadership, certainly, but I don't want us to, have, to walk away with the misconception that it's all about leadership and nothing to do with management. Management's not as effective or contributes as much to our outcomes as, uh, as leadership. And the truth is they both do. So in, in, in summary on this point, the key to um, a workplace that thrives, that prospers, that engages the people uh, who work there and, and engages their, their customers, their clients, or in your case in general practice, your patients, your stakeholders in the broader community as well, are those organisations, those workplaces that recognise the need for great management and great leadership. Now, it was interesting, just recently I was reading an article uh, called The Obama Delusion. And it was really interesting because they, they talked about um, his great leadership but poor management. And I thought that was just an interesting spin on things from one of the universities um, in, uh, in the US. And, uh, and there's been many to come out and, and critique his presidency. And, uh, and it was interesting that they've um, referred or described and critiqued that, that presidency and, and his legacy uh, in terms of management and leadership. So, uh, so you may all have a view on that um, different uh, to that, uh, and I'm not expressing what my view is on that particular issue, except to say that people are having this discussion around management and leadership and what they both mean. And even, at, even in the White House, even on Capitol Hill, they're saying there's a need for great leadership as well as great management. So, um, so yeah, there's, there, it's happening everywhere. This discussion is happening everywhere, even in, even in South America. So, uh, so let, 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 us, let us carry on because it's important that we cover uh, a, a number of great important issues tonight. And that is around the challenge we have of wearing the different hats within, uh, within our role. Because it's quite a challenge because we have so many different things we need to do. So many different demands on our time. And uh, we've, we've got to be doing everything that we've got to be doing from a management and a leadership perspective and still get all the work done. We've still got to see the patients. We've still got to order the, um, the, the resources and the stock for the, for the practice. We've still got to you know, pay the bills. We've still got to get all of these things done. And we've still got to demonstrate our ability to lead effectively. Well, in that regard, there's, there's something that I'd like to describe as the leadership action dynamic, because this section of tonight's webinar is about action and the actions of leaders. And what I'd like to share with you is what I describe as a leadership action dynamic. And, and here is a dynamic that's going on constantly. And we need to be mindful of what this dynamic is all about so that we can check ourselves on a regular basis as to whether we're doing enough around this, um, in this space of leadership. So let's have a look at what, what, what it's all about. I, I've identified, and, and looking at some of the research and looking at where organisations do well and where they go wrong, what I've found is that there are essentially three parts to, um, to the role of us taking action as a leader. There is one aspect of it is when we speak. That is formally, and it could be through uh, at a meeting, or it might possibly be at a seminar, or it could be to patients, or it could be to the team, or it could be, of course, informally, one-to-one, -one, more of a casual chat in the tea room or whatever, or over a coffee. We're speaking all the time. It's part of our role. And what can happen is that the way that we speak and how we speak and what we speak about can have a massive influence on the outcomes that we achieve as a leader, as a manager, as an organisation, as a business, as a practice. We need to be mindful of what we're talking about and how we're talking about it. And because people are listening, people are tuning in to what we express verbally. What what we also have is uh, we're, we're doing a lot of writing. We send emails constantly to one another. We're writing memos. We're sending out letters. We're, um, we're perhaps participating in social media. We're writing all the time. We're communicating to our customers or to our patients. We're, we're 
interacting with people in a written sense as well all of the time. We're writing notes in diaries. We've got a communication folder for this in some workplaces. And so we're, we're writing notes all of the time. And the message that I keep wanting to express to leaders is that what, it, what are you writing about and how are you writing about it? And because this is a, an issue around how we interact with people, but also it's a productivity issue as well. And it's about people, productivity, and performance. And, and what we need to be conscious of is the fact that what we say and also what we record in writing has a critical impact on the way that we go about our work and what we're able to achieve. And thirdly, making up this um, dynamic is the way that we act. What are the behaviours we demonstrate? What are the what are the things we're doing day to day? And how, how, what are the behaviours that we are displaying at work when we're in front of a patient compared to those that we're displaying when we're in front of our colleagues? Are they different? The action, uh, the actions we display and the behaviours we demonstrate are are absolutely critical. And bringing these uh, bits together, it's, it's, when, you th when you bring together the whole idea of speaking and acting, it, you've got that little section there on, on the slide. And, I, and that all goes to the way you speak and whether you follow that up with, the, um, with what you do, your action, I, that goes towards your reliability as a leader. Those leaders who are reliable, and that's what people are looking for. You look at all the polls, they're wanting reliability in a leader. What they're saying is what the person says is in this leadership role and the way that they behave and act has a massive impact. Is it, do they follow through on what they're, what they're talking about? And there's many, many times where we get caught and we say, yep, we're going to do one thing, but we don't necessarily follow through. And what can happen as a result is that people question our reliability. And that's happening all the time, whether we're conscious of it or not. If you look at the dynamic uh, between speaking and writing in this little space here, this goes towards our consistency. So we, have, we say one thing, but what are we, what are we communicating uh, in writing? So what, 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 are we, what, are we, what message are we sending out there? And we need to be consistent as leaders. We need to have a level of consistency so that people can respect the fact that we have a position on something and we're consistent on it. So what we say and what we write has to and in that third uh, crossover there, where writing and acting, what you write about is that followed up. Are you are you living and breathing it? Are you demonstrating behaviours that are, that are supportive of what you've written? That goes towards your predictability. And these three elements are three elements that all the polls are telling us that people are looking for in their leaders. They want someone who's reliable to lead them. But they also want someone who's consistent. That, 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 that's consistent in their view, is consistent in the way that they communicate, is consistent with their point of view as it's verbally and in writing. But they're also looking for someone who's predictable. Now, predict predictability is sometimes given a bit of a bad name. You say, oh, as a leader, I don't want to be predictable. I want to be unpredictable. Well, that doesn't serve people that you work with and try and lead. Predictability doesn't mean you're always going to have the same response um, to a range of circumstances. Predictability is got a different response for a unique set of circumstances. But people understand your, your predictability is about in this set of situation, in this set of circumstances, in, in, in this predicament, you're going to respond this way. You're going to act this way. And in another set of circumstances, you're going to act a different way. That is still being predictable. But people are aware of what you're likely to respond to. So what, what we need to be speaking, writing, and acting about is what I like to describe as authentic leadership. Because if you can speak you can write and write and act in a way that is reliable, that is consistent and is predictable, that, in my view, is the definition of an authentic leader. Because if you don't, what people are questioning is what your motives are, what's driving you, what's going to be the next behaviour you demonstrate. That's not authentic. Authentic leadership is about speaking, writing, and acting in a reliable, consistent way. But it doesn't end there, and nor does our webinar. Because what we have is the need to speak, write, and act about um, a, a particular vision that we have. And my, my question for you is, what vision do you have? Now, I'm just going to put a polling question up right now, um, if it comes up easily. And that is around who works um, in a place that has a clear and compelling vision. So I just ask you to respond to that. I'm just curious about how many of you work somewhere that has a clear and compelling vision of its future. 
And so the numbers are coming in at the moment and we've got about three quarters of people saying no. And that's still fairly consistent, even with greater numbers coming in. Uh, there's still around 70 to 75, it varies in there. What is good is that there's about 30% of you who, who do, that you have a clear, compelling vision of your future. Now, the thing about this vision is that it's critical for the future. Because what, what we want to be really, really conscious of is if you're my leader, people are asking the question, where are you leading me to? And that's the essence of a vision. Because if we're going to be in these leadership roles, which many of you are already in, my question would be is what your vision is. Are you able to speak, write and act in a way that displays and demonstrates and supports your vision? I, when I go to organisations and I go to their office and, and meet with them and, and things like that, um, I'm typically waiting in reception um, to be called through to this meeting. And I have a little game to pipe, um, to pipe the time while I'm waiting for my meeting to commence and people to meet me there. And I have this little game that I play, which is called Spot the Vision. And, and what I do is I look around the walls of the reception or I look around the hallway or in the boardroom if we eventually get to that point for our meeting. And I, and I look for the vision statement. And it's usually framed, it's beautifully printed, lovely frame, sits proudly on the wall. And the question I have in my head is how many people um, speak about this, how many people write about this, and how, do, how many people act in a way that is consistent, reliable, and predictable, and supportive of this vision. Because when I, when I have the audacity to ask that question at certain meetings, um, it's a really interesting response. You know, when I ask them, well, what's your vision? Their first response is to look around the room and find it on a wall somewhere. Now, where is our vision statement? And I'll read it out to you. Well, that, that's not exactly what I meant. What I meant was, what's, what's your idea of the vision for your organisation, for your workplace, for your general practice? Because the question that, if you're my leader, where are you leading me to, is a question you must be able to answer. Because I don't want you leading me over a cliff. Or I don't want you to uh, lead me into, into the darkness because you haven't got, you haven't got a view um, of where, what that future looks like. So importantly, we need to be clear on what that vision is. Now, I read an interesting um, fact about flying um, recently. And uh, I was reading an article about travel. And uh, and they and what caught my eye, apart from the fact that they were describing all these delicious destinations to go to on holidays and things like that, they made a comment that said, on average, if you're flying from Melbourne to LA, so that's from Melbourne, Salamarine Airport to LAX, Los Angeles Airport, you are off target more than 85% of the time that you're in the air. That is, you won't arrive at your destination for 85% of the time you're in the air. And that, I did a double take on that, on that point in the article. And I went, wow, so what's happening then? Well, the thing about a vision, which is, for instance, the vision of getting from Melbourne to LAX, is that, that's, what, that's our destination. That's what we're trying to get to. But we're up in the air, and we're, in, uh, and we're flying along, and when the pilots or the captain of the aircraft, the navigator, whoever is in the pointiest end of the, of the plane, when they realise they're off target, when they realise that they're not exactly on track to arrive at the destination, they don't suddenly pack it in. They don't say, oh, I'm hopeless at this. Oh, I'm no good at piloting an aircraft. They don't, they don't suddenly say, oh, let's turn around and go back to Melbourne. This is hopeless. Let's go back to the way, where we were. What they do is that they keep tweaking the, their approach, they keep moving, just making all these subtle uh, differences, these subtle adjustments to where they're going. They don't give it all away. And this is one of the things about a vision. We're not going to be on target for our vision 100% of the time. You're kidding yourself if you think you will be. Because things happen, just like in an aircraft, there's crosswinds, there's drafts, there's air traffic coming through, there's potholes or whatever, turbulence, whatever they are in the air. What you have, is all of these factors that are taking you off course. And that's exactly what happens in the real world, on the ground, in your general practice. There are going to be things taking you off course all of the time. The person who packs it in, that ain't leadership. That's someone who would prefer to go back to where it was. The person who makes the adjustment and makes the decision to make an adjustment, that's what leadership is. 
despite the challenges, despite the buffering from the different um, uh, factors that are going on inside your workplace. It's about this is a vision we're going to head towards. And I've got the courage and the confidence to give it a go. And I want to influence these people to come. That's the essence of leadership. So if you're going from Melbourne to LA, or from uh, certain results in your general practice, you've got to have a vision. You've got to know what your destination is. And you've got to work towards getting it. Even when you feel you're way off track. So bringing that very point, what is it about staying on track? Well, there's a school of thought out there, a very broad school of thought, and I'm a bit of a loner on this, about performance management. And I don't like the term performance management. I really don't. However, I've been trained in it um, for very early on in my career, yeah, 25, 30 years ago, I was trained in it and things like that. And, uh, I've, I've taken a different view. And I don't like the term performance management because when you talk about managing, just as I mentioned a little earlier, you're talking about containing stuff. You know, we, we manage our finances. What does that mean? We manage them within a set budget. We, um, I do a lot of work with the Metropolitan Fire Brigade in Melbourne. And they talk about um, managing a crisis or managing a fire. What do they do? They measure themselves on containing a fire to its womb of origin. That is, I manage a fire by maintaining it next to its source. I don't want it to spread. I don't want it to get out of control. And of course, you need this in emergency services. But I don't think it's necessarily the right approach when it comes to working with people in a workplace. So what I prefer to do is just have a slight twist on this. And I prefer the term performance encouragement. I think people want to do a great job. And there was a survey result that came out that said something along the lines just the other week, 87% uh, of employees in Australia are disengaged. And my little comment, uh, because I, I occasionally contribute to Twitter, my, my comment was, but did they arrive on day one like that? Did they arrive to their work, to their job, on day one disengaged, not wanting to do a good job? I doubt it. But what's happened along the way to get them to that point? And my view, you've got to look at the leadership in the organisation because that's where it happens. How do we keep these people on track? I, I have a view that it's around performance and courage. And what, what, what could that possibly look like? Well, that could possibly look like uh, providing feedback to people for one that's balanced, that is, that, that's fair, that's reasonable, uh, that it's action oriented, which means that it's people who uh, that the feedback you're providing is to people that's all about the action they can take. And you always deliver in a timely way and it's always meaningful for people. Feedback is always constructive. It takes, has consideration of the person's feelings and how they're feeling uh, in terms of being, having, uh, being empathetic. But, and of course, the, one of the core principles is the confidentiality of that feedback as well. We need to remain confidential about the, the conversation we have when we're talking about uh, wanting to uh, encourage a person, a person's performance. So again, there's just another poll coming up that um, uh, Laura might bring up to the screen at some point shortly around who has received worthwhile and meaningful feedback from a manager or a supervisor in the past. At some point in your career, have you received worthwhile, meaningful feedback from a manager or supervisor in the past? And wow, overwhelmingly the numbers are saying 85, 90 percent thereabouts are saying, yes, I have received that feedback. And what, what that is telling me is that you've had the experience, you've had the benefit of receiving worthwhile feedback that was balanced, it was action oriented, it was timely, it was meaningful, it was constructive, it took consideration of your feelings and it, and it remained confidential. And that, that would be my hallmark of saying if something was meaningful and worthwhile from a feedback perspective. And that's great. So there are some who haven't received meaningful, worthwhile feedback and that may be because you aren't in a workplace setting as yet perhaps, potentially or it's just not part of the culture or the way that things are done within your workplace setting. And, and for that, that, I, that would be a shame, that would be a disappointment because we're certainly missing out on accessing some great feedback. So what I'd like to share with you is a really simple model around providing feedback. And it's the AID model, and you can quickly make a note of that if, if you're a note taker tonight. And that is, when you're providing feedback that's meaningful and worthwhile, we always describe actions and behaviours. We don't talk about personality. We don't talk about attitude. What we talk about always is about uh, actions and behaviours because that's actionable. That's stuff that, we, that is tangible and that we can relate to. And when we're having that discussion with them, 
what we always want to share with them is the impact of those actions. Now, a lot of people think, oh, so when someone's done something wrong, yes, true, describe the action or behaviour of what wasn't appropriate or what wasn't supportive or supportive of the direction you wanted to take and describe the impact that's having. Why is it um, having this impact or why is it having an impact? What the impact is, but also at the same time, have this discussion with people when, when you catch people doing stuff right. And there's so much good stuff that gets done out there by people that goes totally unrecognised. But we're really quick to pounce for those of us who have the confidence and courage to do it on those people who are performing or behaving in a way that is um, less appropriate. So look to catch, to catch people doing stuff right. And what we always want to do is then transfer that conversation into a discussion around what's next. What are the desired outcomes? What would you like to see happen? And, and have the chance to have that discussion. So the AID model, the actions, impact, and desired outcomes, is just really easy to remember. And if you contain your discussion around that, that's, you can have a performance encouraging discussion um, around that if you keep it the AID in mind. Really simple, really straight to the point. Because the types of feedback you're going to be giving, and the only type of feedback we give is that feedback that is positive or it's constructive. We don't talk about negative feedback. Because the most, well, there is, the, the negative feedback is feedback that diminishes someone. What I want to talk about is, as leaders, is, is feedback that is constructive, that builds someone, that you construct something out of this discussion, not diminish, not destruct, but construct something out of that, out of that feedback discussion. And so what it might look like is about positive feedback reinforcing uh, the behaviour. It's about enhancing the person's confidence and, the, and, and encouraging them to do more. It's, it's always positive. You want people to be, keep doing what they're doing. And constructive feedback might look a little different, uh, but it's always given to correct or change a behaviour. And your aim, your role here is to help them do something better. It's about raising their capability to perform at a higher level than they currently are in a particular aspect of their work or in their life. It's about encouraging better performance. This is about performance encouragement, not about performance management. Don't contain them, allow them to explore what's possible for them and encourage them to have that exploration because that's what leaders do. They recognise the potential of people and recognise the need to give them this platform to explore what's possible in the work that they do. Now, with teams and, and, and the people that you work with, I just wanted to sh uh, share with you a very uh, a model that's been around for some time now. It's not my own, but um, by, by Bruce Tuckman that came around some time ago, and you've probably perhaps seen it or referred to it in the, in the past. And he said there's four, originally he said there's four stages of team development. So when you're leading a team, you need to expect it to experience these four stages. And then later in his work, he identified a fifth stage as well. So what he said, when, when people first come together, he describes that as the forming stage. And that typically consists of um, a group of people coming together. It could be for a project or it could be a workplace situation. And even if you just add one person, recruit a new person into an existing team, you have a brand new team, is what he went to length to, um, to suggest to people. And this forming stage, people, uh, we don't know what people know yet. And people are jockeying for position. We don't know whether there's an element of trust within the team at the moment. And so we're just forming, we're just coming together for that first time. And interestingly, after a period of time, and there's no um, suggestion as to how long it is, it could be hours, days, weeks, months, or years, we move into a storming stage. And what Tuckman went to great lengths to suggest is that this is about conflict. And no team can achieve its potential without it. And he said, this is where there's a great deal of distrust and people hoard their knowledge. That is, I, I'm not going to share it with you. I'm going to keep it because I want to be top dog here. I'm going to be the top person, so I'm going to keep it all to myself and I'm not going to share. Because as soon as I disclose stuff, uh, knowledge that I have, my intellectual property, what happens then is that I weaken my position and I want, don't want to be in a weak position. So there's a great deal of conflict happening within, within this team setting. And then ultimately, out of this, if the team have the skills and the leader has the skills to facilitate this transition into a stage that he referred to as norming. And this is where you have collaboration and knowledge sharing, not knowledge hoarding, but knowledge sharing. And what he then suggested is that's where you start to normalise what is appropriate behaviour. You start to recognise what works, what doesn't, and this is how we're going to move forward. And ultimately, 
if the team continues on this trajectory, they ultimately get to a performance stage. And that's what we want to be able to get to with our team. Now, he did say that there is a, a fifth stage, and he called it a journey or mourning, as in M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. And he talks about that in his literature elsewhere, about the, the disband, disbandment of, um, um, of a particular team, or it moves on or it breaks up for whatever reason. And in this performing stage, he, he talks about not just about knowledge sharing, but creativity. He talks about where things are created, something is built in this post, in this process. And so a synergy starts to arise within the team. And that's where we get our highest level of Now, I don't know about you, but there is in teams, as Tuckman suggested, there is a degree of conflict. And most people I talk to aren't really keen on conflict. They, uh, it's something that we have this fight or flight mechanism built into us from the, from the historic, uh, prehistoric times. And that is that uh, if uh, we're faced with conflict or where we feel threatened, we either um, fight it and take it on, or we get the heck out of there and avoid it. And uh, sometimes that's our natural instinct is not necessarily the right response. So what I want to share with you is, is what do leaders do? And, and what, they, what leaders do is when they're faced with conflict, they, they use the knowledge of themselves, and that is what works for them, what doesn't work for them, what are their positive triggers, what are their negative triggers, what the psychology of them is all about. They understand how they think and act. And they also understand and apply that same level of thinking to the people around them, and what the drive is, what's the motivation to find some sort of a solution or misunderstanding, a uh, solution to a misunderstanding or a because that's where a lot of conflict and crisis start. They, they, they start with just a simple misunderstanding. They just spin out of control and ultimately end up in a, a sort of a crisis. So what leaders do is they understand and are prepared to take that, um, to take that responsibility. And just a very simple um, model by Kilman suggested that what we, what we base our response on is the level of the uh, importance of the relationship and, and the outcome. And if the, uh, if the relationship, which is on the vertical axis, is, is quite high, if the importance of that relationship is quite high, and the outcome, the importance of the outcome is quite high, we have a very collaborative approach. We go for win-win. But if any of those, relationship or outcome, and their subsequent importance are lessened, we tend to take a different approach. And so if we have high relationship value and low outcome value, we're accommodating, that is, we we want to preserve the relationship, and we call that lose, I lose to win. I'm prepared to lose in order to preserve my relationship with that person. If we have a high outcome importance but low relationship, I'm very, very competitive on that issue because I'm going to win at all costs. That is, what's important is the outcome, and if the relationship disintegrates, well, so be it. And of course, there are extremes. And Clearly, what the model suggests as well is that when there is um, low degrees of importance to the outcome and to the relationship, we tend to avoid it. We, we, we go into lose-lose. We just give up or we try to bury it and pretend it's going to go away. And, and what, what's being suggested here is that we need to identify how we respond to conflict and whether it's the right sort of approach to take to a particular conflict. So, there's some uh, notes here that I'll just quickly breeze through because they're just supporting exactly what I just mentioned there. That we have a win-win approach being highly collaborative, that we have a, a win-lose approach being um, highly compromising when we seek to give up something and we have a compromised outcome. And as well as that, we have a, a competing process as well where we just want to get our results um, achieved and not necessarily those of the other people. So we're very, very competitive. We're very accommodating in those situations when we want to appease someone. And as well as that, we can be in that avoidance mode where we, um, we just don't even acknowledge the fact that a conflict exists or we withdraw it or withdraw from it or, or, or suppress it. So there's a number of factors that drive that. And, and just I'm mindful of, mindful of time, and I just had a couple of things that I wanted to share with you before we, um, before we move on to our Q&A. And that's how we extend our influence. And I wanted to share with you a, a leadership influence ladder. And what that refers to is the level of impact that we have, our level of influence. And you can see it's divided in between red zones and blue zones. The red zones are scored negatively, the blue zones scored positively, because in the, when we're operating and our influence is negative, um, in the red zone, we are taking the organization, our workplace, and our people backwards. 
because there are some behaviours that people demonstrate that make people angry, that make develop resentment in people, or frustrate them. And when leaders frustrate or resent, uh, develop, build resentment or, or or anger within people, people have a very have an approach to their work that consists of, is very much characterised by limitation, or they undermine what's trying to be done, or actively go out and, and try to destroy it. And it's taking the organisation backwards, it's taking the team backwards, it's taking the general uh, the practice backwards as well. And in my view, I think that you're better off not having that leader even there, because it's just taking you too far back. What we want to do is, at the very minimum, as a leader, we want to develop curiosity uh, amongst our people about our destination, about our vision. Because as soon as people are curious, they have a, they open their, the opportunity up. They start to be more open to what's ahead of them. If you can work with people through the way that you speak and the right and act you, and generate interest, people are going to start exploring opportunities and options for you and get action done when you totally engage with them. And so what we need to aim for is that level of engagement around the work that we're doing and, and the vision that we have of, the, of our particular workplace. Because that's where action happens. And those leaders that are truly great, what they do is that they inspire the people around them and they inspire them towards greatness. That is, they achieve something that was never thought possible and they take the organisation, whether that's large or small, they take that practice, they take that business, they take that um, department into a direction that is way beyond what anyone has, could possibly imagine. And what that takes is your level of trust and your level of skill. Because you may have high trust but have low skills in this area and that's just going to create anxiety amongst people. You could have high skills but you don't have, haven't built the trust yet, people are going to be very sceptical about what you're doing. And if you have low skills and low trust, people are just going to be frustrated because they're just not getting to achieve what they want to achieve at work and ultimately may choose to resign from that work. So what you're trying to do is to be a change leader and that relies on two factors and that is the level of trust you've created and the level of skills you have. And I describe that as both being about both character and competence. And no matter where you are, you're ultimately trying to get into that zone, the top right hand quadrant. So what we're trying to do is move ourselves and, and the team that we're with and approach our work from what I like, um, from a perspective I like to describe as about accountability. I used that word right at the very beginning about the characteristics of leaders. They have a strong sense of accountability. I'm going to solve it if I see it. <clears throat> I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to own it. That's what I like to describe as above the line thinking. As opposed to those uh, people who think below the line and play the blame game as I like to describe it as. And that's uh, looking for direction or just waiting and seeing or just thinking that, ah, oh, that's not going to work. That's below the line thinking. And, and the question I have is if we, if we could scan your mindset day to day, when you're at work, what would we hear more of? Would we hear more above the line mindset or below the line? What would we hear from you? And what we need to be conscious of is the need to carry our mindset with us into the workplace that is about positivity, is about courage, is about confidence, and has a clear direction where you want to go. So this is... Uh, really the, the sum total of where I wanted to get to this evening. And we've covered a lot. We've probably covered a, a two-day <laughs> workshop in an hour, and I've thrown a lot at you. But perhaps something has tweaked your interest or curiosity or, or potentially um, reminded you of some things that uh, you weren't overly conscious of. Um, or it may have just supported a lot of your approaches already to the work that you do. Uh, and if that's the case, that's fantastic. What I would like to do in the time we have remaining is to hand over um, the point right now to any questions that people might have. Do we have any coming through in the time that we've got remaining? Mindset? Okay, so we're back on the character and confidence slide. Um, would that be the right one? Um, yes, yeah, so that's, again, just reiterating, it's around um, uh, levels of trust and level of skill because um, you need a blend of both. And it's those people who possess those high skills 
uh, as a leader, but also has invested in the trust levels within, uh, between you as a leader and the rest of the team. They're the people who become the change leaders because people are engaged and want to actually uh, transition <coughs> toward where they, from where they are right now to where they ultimately um, are aiming to go um, with your guidance. And one after that? Yep, certainly. And that's where we're referring to about above and below the line uh, thinking. It's around mindset, really. Um, uh, because what we have is the need to around accountability. And that is one of the hallmarks of, a, um, uh, of an effective leader, that they, are, they hold themselves accountable. They don't point the finger. And uh, they, many, many years ago, I worked for a, um, uh, I worked in retail a long, long, long time ago. I cut my teeth at Meyer up in Sydney. And, uh, and I had a store manager at the time, Leo, and he was one of the per people I, I would uh, consider one of the great leaders I've, I've ever, and great managers for that matter, that I've ever had the pleasure to work with. And we still remain in contact. And, uh, and the thing, he, he shared with, this, uh, with the whole team at that store, uh, the management team at that store, which uh, I was a part of. And, uh, and he said, when fish stink, they always stink from the head first. And I thought that was a really interesting analogy when you apply it to leadership. And, and he, his view is that he's ultimately the person who's accountable and responsible for results. And that's why he needs to take certain actions. He needs to um, talk a certain way, communicate a certain message. He needs to write about things and he needs to uh, display ac action that are um, uh, meeting a certain outcome. And so it's about the steps to accountability. Yeah, sure, fire away. Could I, uh, could I just, yeah, before you move on to that one, uh, uh, on to another, uh, what, what, if you've got a, a manager in a workplace that's domineering, and, uh, and I'm assuming here in relation to that question that uh, you report to this manager. They call that process um, uh, managing up. And what I describe it as is the need for you and this person to have a crucial conversation. Um, a, a conversation where the stakes are high and uh, naturally enough, uh, there's potential conflict, conflict and also there's a, there's, um, a, lot, uh, a, lot, a lot at risk here and uh, differing opinions. Like it's a really crucial conversation that you need to have with your manager to, to express to them um, the, the impact of their behaviour. So talk about the action, talk about the impact, and talk about the desired outcome. Follow the AID uh, model, and you've got a framework at least. You've got to fill the rest of it out, but at least you've got a framework as to what sort of conversation to have with a person. I like to describe them as a crucial conversation. And uh, there's an organisation that I'm working with every month I'm running crucial conversations workshops with, um, with their team. And uh, because they're having very crucial conversations at the moment, uh, through the trend, uh, change process that that organisation is going through. So it's, um, it's a conversation you need to have. Because you've, you've flagged it here, and so I suggest that it's perhaps something that's on your mind. Mm, mm. Uh, that, that's, that's a great question or a great theme uh, of questions there. And the reason why I, I believe it's, uh, it is that is because it goes right to the heart of leadership. And that is when you go back to those um, qualities of, of an effective leader, what a number of them refer to is about having courage and having confidence. Having the courage to think a little differently, having the courage to have a conversation with someone that might be a little bit difficult or challenging, to have the, the confidence to say, no, this is something that I need to do, this is something that we as a, as, a, as a workplace need to do more of, and have that conversation because we need to talk about, or you need to talk about, what, what the value of that would be. How, if we did do more of that, the question I would ask if I was in that workplace, if we did do more of what you're suggesting, more of this leadership, what, um, what's the value? Where, where will we be? Will we be any better off? And uh, so um, I would really uh, strongly suggest that you have that conversation. It's going to take some courage to have, but also uh, the confidence to have. And you could um, uh, prepare your case, so to speak, 
able to have that, even if you're in an environment that's not conducive, you may need to just uh, take the lead, as uh, this whole question of leadership is all about. Yeah, that's a that's a, a great question. Uh, I've got several answers to that. Uh, one of them is to continue the conversation around leadership. I think that's absolutely critical. Where do you go to continue that conversation? Uh, you read, you uh, you participate in forums like this. You uh, also, and I'm going to share with you a couple of ideas right now on the screen. Uh, you 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 start to seek out those associations, such as what Abner's doing tonight. That also other associations such as the Human Resources Institute, uh, Australian Institute of Management. They, even though their name suggests it's the Institute of Management, they have a, a massive investment in, in leadership capability and the work that they do around that very question. Um, so there's looking for forums and looking for ways to tap into the conversation that's happening right now. And which brings me to the next point around what are some steps you could take to continue the, this very conversation. Um, well, a really simple thing you can do, I've got a, a white paper that's um, totally free of charge, but you can go to my website and download that white paper. It's all about authentic leadership and, and is consistent with a number of the principles that we've discussed tonight. Um, but you just go, go to stewardconstable.com, um, put in your name and email address, and a copy of that um, white paper's emailed um, straight out to you. So you should have it within, you know, within minutes of registering for it. So, um, so that's available to you if you go to stewardconstable.com. Um, a good way of just, for that person who mentioned about having this conversation around leadership at work, that could be a really good thought starter for what sort of comments you're going to make to your workplace around that. Uh, another thing you can do, and uh, again, to continue this conversation, I send out a, a regular newsletter. Uh, if you're going to download the white paper, you can add your name and email address, and, and I'll send out an email, there's, um, an emailed newsletter to you. Now, that's something that I that I put together on a regular basis. There's just three examples of the, the three latest ones that I've um, done, but I put this, uh, this newsletter together for the, that very purpose that you're describing. How do we continue this conversation? How do we keep it going? Um, absolutely critical you do that. So um, download a white paper, uh, there's a newsletter there, and there's plenty of availability of newsletters um, when you start looking for this whole question uh, in this whole space. Um, the, the other opportunity um, is about staying connected around this, around this space. So I spend a bit of time on LinkedIn. Now, uh, I don't know whether Laura is in a position to put up a quick poll because there's um, exit surveys going on at the moment. So I, won't, uh, I don't want to interrupt that. Oh, yes, there is. Fantastic. Um, could I just get an idea of who is on LinkedIn? Who actually has a profile on LinkedIn at the moment? Okay, so about 30% of you have, um, majority, the remainder, um, mostly haven't. Could I really encourage you, for those of you who are not on LinkedIn, could I encourage you to get on it? Um, the reason being uh, is that there's just, it, your, your um, colleagues, your peers, who have similar questions around leadership aren't hanging out on Facebook. I'm sorry, but they're just not, okay? If you're wanting to have a conversation around this stuff, the conversation's happening on LinkedIn. And you can get, go there, set up a profile. Again, it's all free of charge. Set up a profile and start expressing what you're interested in and you can start connecting to people um, as well as um, different organisations, as well as people who are influencers and who are talking regularly on this. You can follow them um, and you can get the opportunity to continue this conversation on LinkedIn. So 70% of people aren't on it. I would say that 70% that, uh, that of people, you really do need to get onto LinkedIn. It doesn't matter how big or small your profile is, but it's also a way of establishing your influence um, because that's what leadership is. And, uh, and that's where leaders are hanging out. They hang out on LinkedIn. Um, I, I'm quite uh, active on LinkedIn because it's just a wealth of knowledge to be shared on there. And I love, I, I'm just, Sponging, soaking up the so the generosity of so many people around through their articles and through their um, through their suggestions and recommendations. It's just fantastic stuff. So um, make a commitment to getting on there um, and at least putting your name and contact details on there just to begin with, 
And just like Facebook, if you're a member participant of that, it'll start suggesting people through your email addresses and things like that of people who are on LinkedIn that you may want to connect with. Um, as I am on LinkedIn, there's um, you know, 30 there's 30 odd people who said yes, they are on LinkedIn. Over the next 24 hours, can you send me a note to say um, hi and um, let's connect? I'd love to connect with you because that's again, that's a chance of um, keeping the conversation going. Uh, a lot of people that I mentioned Twitter too, they ha they roll their eyes and go, I just can't see the point. What could possibly be learnt in 140 or 120 characters, whatever it is? Um, I agree with you, but what those 140 characters are doing that are shared with people is that they're linking you to an article about something. That's where good, uh, effective use of Twitter is happening. And there's a big shift in Twitter at the moment where people are starting to, uh, or not starting to, they've been doing it for some years now, but it's growing. And that is around um, posting articles that what they put on Twitter is the link to that article. And that's what you want. That's the goal. That's the gold nugget that's sitting on the ground there that you've got to pick up. And, um, and again, great content. Wealth of content. There's a lot of rubbish on Twitter too. You know, depending on what what floats your boat, um, it uh, depends on. Uh, will determine what you access. Um, however, there's um, again just really, really, really good stuff out there. So um, any we've we've hit that time frame. I'm just being managed by the other people at Apple here. Winding up. Okay, fantastic. I better do as I'm told. Um, so uh, I just wanted to just share with you just at the very end here, just my contact details. There's an email address, it's certainly a mouthful, um, but it, you can jot it down if you wish. It's Stuart, and that's a U-A-R-T, at the Centre for Inspired Leadership, and that's .com.au. Uh, there's a couple of websites there. There's the same website for Centre for Inspired Leadership, and there's my own, as I mentioned. Now, again, just wanted to go back to that reference to um, LinkedIn. If you want to connect with me, um, because we haven't connected before, they'll ask you, do you know Stuart's email address? You'll need to put that one in, um, because that's the one that's registered with um, LinkedIn. So use that email address to connect. Um, so really, folks, that, that, brings us to, that brings us to a close. That's me sitting on a sand dune, standing on a sand dune in a suit. I don't know why someone would do that, but it's just a bloody good photo. And, um, so I thought I'll sign off now. Uh, thank you so much for giving up your um, time, effort, and energy and devoting it to tonight's session. I've thoroughly enjoyed the opportunity to, to chat with you. Um, thank you for your contributions to all of the polling that's gone on. It's been like the Bureau of Statistics here tonight. Um, so uh, thank you for your contribution to that. And could I please pass on my thanks to the APNA team for the invitation to part, be a part of this uh, and to them just organising it so beautifully. It's, um, it's gone swimmingly. So, Thank you so much and thank you for your feedback. There's a lot of um, appreciative comments coming through in the chat room. So till then, good night.